cosmology is on the one hand remarkably successful and on the other hand full of holes. Uh, you should understand that that's not unusual. Consider that Maxwell's equations are spectacular. Where would, where would society be without Maxwell's equations? Yet, when you apply them to a simple hydrogen atom, they go wrong. You could say, correctly, that means that Maxwell's equations are wrong. But that doesn't mean you should start burning the books that teach Maxwell's equations. They're spectacularly good approximations, but of course limited. Uh, you could replace Max Maxwell's equations are improved by quantum electrodynamics, passes wonderfully demanding tests. But of course, it's only uh, the limiting case of electroweak stability, which is a part of the particle physics model that everyone is convinced is, is lame, got to be improved. In short, uh, it's, a, it's this case with all physical sciences. They are very successful among the best of them. They're very impressively good, but they could be better. So in this case, first a quick review. Uh, of uh, the expanding universe notion. Imagine you live on the surface of a balloon. You heard this if you attended my talk yesterday, but pretend you live in two dimensions on the surface of a balloon. The balloon is being built, blown up. You are not expanding. The galaxy is not expanding, but galaxies are moving apart. And you notice the wonderful point that you sit on a galaxy, the ones around it are moving away from you. You may say, well, the universe is expanding from me. But of course, wherever you are in the balloon, you reach the same conclusion. Second, you notice that if you look at a galaxy that's fairly nearby and one that's further away, the one that's further away is moving faster in proportion to the distance. That's Hubble's law, which has been very well explored. Um, and here we see it. So. The discovery paper, Hubble, 1929. Uh, he was very proud of the linearity, but it's kind of messy, <laughs> kind of weak. But uh, within short order, they were out to a redshift 4.5. That's 10% of the speed of light, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and it took a long time to get the next factor of 10. So that's good. So that's one datum. Another is we have. Uh, Thermal radiation obtained by two groups. So it is seen that the universe contains a sea of radiation, microwave wavelengths, centimeters, uh, the, uh, very nearly homogeneous, only sli slight departures from homogeneity, a spectrum that is that characteristic of thermal radiation obtained by two groups, uh, either of which would have told the story. And it is a very deeply impressive story, namely, how else could this radiation have relaxed to statistical thermal equilibrium except from a time of when the universe was very different from now, when it was dense and hot enough to have relaxed this radiation to statistical equilibrium. It's a really deep statement. Our universe is not, has not always been the way it is now. It had to have expanded from a hot, dense state in order to account for this remarkably thermal spectrum. Of course, the uh, Hubble's law was telling us much the same thing. It's wonderful to have this check. Two different ways to look at the universe, and you get a similar conclusion, that it expanded from a hot, dense state. Uh, a puzzle in the uh, quarter century ago was that the universe is very clumpy on small scales. Look at all the clumps of the galaxies. The universe uh, of radiation is wonderfully smooth. These are fluctuations of parts in a million. How the devil did the radiation get to stay so smooth while the matter grew so clumpy? In particular, you know that at a redshift of 1,000 and earlier, the radiation temperature was high enough to thermally ionize matter. Uh, the free electrons interact with radiation by Thomson scattering. The free electrons interact with atomic nuclei by Coulomb scattering. The result is that radiation, electrons, and ions act as a fluid with viscosity. 
that fluid has a pressure. Uh, and as the universe expands, the, the fluid uh, shakes like a bowl of jelly. Uh, it has a boundary condition at redshift of about 1,000, and the temperature was 1,000 times the present value. The temperature fell low enough to allow electrons to be captured by ions and become neutral gas. That meant that suddenly, rather quite suddenly, uh, matter and radiation decoupled, uh, leaving then a pattern in the distribution of matter and radiation due to the oscillations present at that decoupling. Uh, and uh, just uh, uh, 1982, no one here was born yet. <laughs> uh, it was a crisis in cosmology. How, what do you, <laughs> there's always exceptions, are <laughs> Uh, 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 a crisis. How in the world do we understand the difference between the distributions of matter and radiation? Well, uh, I threw out, as just a guess, a wild guess, uh, that the, uh, most of the matter is not baryonic, but something uh, that can be called dark matter. The matter that doesn't interact with matter, our ordinary matter and radiation at all strongly, that was a wonderful trick because it meant that the matter, most of the matter, can slip through the freely through the radiation uh, as it grows into clumps, leaving the radiation perturbed largely only by gravity. So I computed the perturbation to the quadrupole moment. Uh, my answer was this, and the measurement was this. Uh, this, 1982, this, uh, almost a quarter century later. Spectacular. Uh, but again, uh, evidence that our theory is on the right direction. And uh, here, uh, Marian acoustic oscillations. Imagine that space is flat and that you decompose the mass distribution into Fourier waves. Here is the amplitude of a Fourier wave on the left. Uh, we start with a universe that is awfully close to uniform, but departures from uniformity grow and they recognize that these departures are acoustic pr pressure waves. So you oscillate until the redshift of 1,000, you decouple, the, the matter can go off and grow in, this in, grow in amplitude uh, free at last from the constraint of the, uh, of the pressure of the radiation. You notice also you change the wavelength slightly. This will end up going down. At a wavelength in between, you will get a zero you will get zero amplitude in those Fourier amplitudes. Uh, that means that the, in the power spectrum, uh, it's clumsily, done, clumsily expressed here, but you have zeros. Uh, a prediction, which I didn't pay much attention to not because I never imagined you can measure these things, but they are measured. So here again in the top, what we expected back in the 70s, and here what is measured in the galaxy distribution. You notice that the oscillations are present, but that's 5% up and down. Uh, why in the world is that? Well, the answer is simple. That dark matter that doesn't interact with the radiation and matter uh, doesn't, is only affected by gravity. It has very low amplitude of fluctuations, and so you get, instead of zeros, very modest oscillations. Evidence for dark matter. And uh, we look again uh, at the power spectra of matter distribution down below as measured by galaxy distributions and above the, the spherical harmonic expansion of the radiation distribution, which is the analog of a Fourier transform in a sphere instead of a plane. Uh, the solid curves, the theory, the same theory for both, but applied to two very different phenomena, distributions of galaxies, angular distribution of radiation. Uh, one set of parameters fits both wonderfully well. It's spectacular. Uh, of course, you had three parameters, some dozen or so, depending on how you count. But you'll have a whole lot more fits to bits of data than do you have parameters. In short, it's really hard to ignore this as evidence 
that the universe really did evolve from a hot, dense state according to the laws of physics that are pretty close to what we think we now know. Um, a wonderful success. We notice next that, of course, there are the Hubble anomaly. Here are parameters you have to adjust to fit the data. Uh, I, I classify them by a redshift. Uh, redshift 10 to the 9, that's when the temperature was hot enough the thermonuclear reactions were determining the primeval abundances of the elements, um, the uh, isotopes, hydrogen and helium. <laughs> Lithium gets a bit of a problem, but it's, it's messy. Hydrogen and helium look pretty clear, clean. Uh, so you get, for example, the baryon density you need to fit observations of deuterium abundance in, uh, in high redshift, low mass galaxies where you think it's close to primeval. They're pretty close to similar. And of course, you have an evidence of the baryon density from those acoustic oscillations because the, wave, the velocity of the pressure wave depends on the molecular, molecular weight, which depends on the abundance of helium. So you have another measure, quite independent type of phenomenon at a quite different time in the evolution of the universe. Uh, then you have uh, the present measurements uh, of the baryon density through fast radio bursts. Uh, none of these are particularly precise measurements, but the dazzlingly important thing is you get consistent results from very different ways of looking at the evolution of the universe. It is this consistency that convinces me that we almost certainly are moving in the right direction. Uh, on these parameters, there is the notorious Hubble tension. You can get the Hubble constant, the rate of expansion of the universe, by looking at the motions of relative and nearby galaxies as they move away from us. Or you can estimate it from the baryon acoustic oscillations, which depend on what was happening at a redshift of 1,000 quite independent set of considerations measured in very different ways, and yet you get within 10%. Wow. On the other hand, that is 10%, and the formal errors are less than that. Maybe this is a problem with the theory. I'm hoping it is, because I'm convinced that the present theory, with its treatment of dark matter and dark energy cosmological constant, surely is, surely is, too schematic. There's got to be a better theory. I'm dreaming. And the way to discover a better theory is to find an er ambiguities, errors, systematic errors in our measurements that are indicative of a theory that is not quite right. That is to say, I'm hoping that as the measurements of these other parameters are improved, other shoes will fall. Other discrepancies will be revealed and we will learn something about how to improve our theory. That's a dream, of course. And uh, dreams along the similar line uh, are that maybe, oh well, I should pause to remark, uh, already in the 1930s, Wolfgang Pauli was quite aware of the absurd nature of the quantum vacuum energy density. Uh, recall that to get the correct binding energy for molecular hydrogen, you have to include the zero point energy of the material oscillators. The two atoms have a zero point energy. You, you must, if you want to get the correct binding energy, you need to take account of that zero point energy. It is real, real. Apply that same consideration to the modes of oscillation of the electromagnetic field, and you get a zero point energy that is, as uh, Pauli realized, is absurdly large. It would curl up the universe, he said, so that it couldn't even reach the moon. Uh, Pauli's solution was to say, well, <coughs> the zero point energies of material fields <coughs> are real. The zero point energies of the electromagnetic field are not real. He must have blushed because it's the same theory applied to two quantum fields. Why would you exclude the zero point energy from one and not the other? It's absurd. No, you'd better count the zero point energy of the electromagnetic field, but then that's absurd too, because the energy density is ridiculously large. 
Um, that problem has been with us since the 1930s. Many have fussed over what it could mean. No one has a good answer. But it, just to make this clear, I want to point out um, that uh, I remember school reports, small children. Uh, Tim and Mary Jane and Alice play well together. Uh, gravity physics and cosmology play well together. First, you have uh, characteristic numbers associated with cosmology, Hubble's constant, gravity, Newton's constant, quantum physics, Planck's constant. Out of Hubble's constant, you get a characteristic time, 10 to the 10th year, which is an interesting number because that's on the order of magnitude, the ages of the oldest stars. So two different considerations uh, gravity physics, local experiments, and the motions of the galaxies can give you the same age within factors of 10, but 4 pi and so on, is quite striking. And it is a good thing. Along with then, you can form from, oh, I, sh I should have remarked that it's this number that combines gravity physics with Hubble's constant, and it gives you a mass density that, again, within orders of magnitude, is the mass density st astronomers m measure by looking at the s your galaxies, weighing the galaxies, counting them up, the mean mass density. That mean mass density agrees with what gravity physics plus cosmology, the expansion of the universe, gives you. It's quite magic, beautiful, and it's part of the unity of physics. But you get to the third line when you throw in quantum physics, you get a reserve, uh, an absurd mass density. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. It has no right to be there. <laughs> Quantum physics does not naturally play well with gravity physics and cosmology, which is a neat puzzle that from time to time you might want to consider. There's a trick. There's, there's a clever, there's something clever going on. Uh, the cleverest response is the anthropic principle. I will not give that any more time. <laughs> uh, so um, just a comment that, uh, yeah. so my dream is to find anomalies that will hint to a better cosmology. Uh, galaxies naturally form in, within the standard theory we have now, galaxies are naturally formed. You have to adjust parameters a bit, but that's all right. You make pretty good looking galaxies. But uh, my belief is that, that to this day, the best of the galaxies simulations you get out of the standard theory are not really close to reality. An example, uh, this recent paper by a respected group, uh, it's this year. And this is looking back at the history of formation of the stars in the thin disk of a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. Uh, look back time is increasing this way, which is to say redshift is increasing this way. This is the early universe. This is now. Time is increasing this way. And this is showing that <coughs> up to uh, look back time, up to about six gig years back in time, uh, the disk was a mess. Material tumbling in was perhaps allowing a disk to form, but then destroying it by gravity. A new disk formed, destroyed, and then at last, at a red look back time, at a redshift of around, uh, well, I don't remember the number, but at modest redshift, uh, things settled down and you started to make a thin disk. This is a lousy approximation, uh, and here's another case, a lousy approximation of the Milky Way for two reasons. First, our disk is much older than that. Uh, Rosie Weiss assured me that th her conclusion in this old paper obtains. In the Milky Way, the thin disk was present back at redshift two, look back time around 12 giga years. Uh, it's not like the uh, models. And furthermore, those models, by making and destroying disks repeatedly, until look back time, six give you years, means there's a lot of stars that are not in the disk. They're in a stellar halo of some sort. 
Our galaxy has a stellar halo, but it contains a small fraction of the mass of the stars in the disk. It just doesn't look right. Um, there's an easy answer to the explanation for this, namely, uh, namely that th we don't even understand how stars form. How do you expect to make a realistic galaxy? And that's a fair statement. In other words, uh, it's hard to argue that an anomaly in the way you make galaxies theoretically is a true anomaly in the physics rather than simply the result of the complexity of the task. So I, I propose we ought to move on in the search for uh, anomalies. And so I turn to uh, these, this couple, Antoinette and Gérard de Vaucouleur, Paris, 1962. Uh, I remember Paris in springtime. <laughs> they uh, were responsible for the reference catalog of galaxies that I made heavy use of back in the 1970s. Um, Gerard, in particular, refers to a paper by Zira Rubin. Zira Cooper Rubin, uh, you might remember, was one of the pioneers in measuring rotation curves of galaxies and finding evidence that dark matter is in around galaxies. Uh, an early paper, she found evidence for a differential rotation of the inner metagalaxy that had flattened it. The rotation part has not stood the stand of time, but it is the case that the nearby galaxies are in a flattened distribution. Uh, that is, Girard gave the name uh, local supercluster. Remarkably flat distribution. Uh, they did not anticipate how flat it would be found out to be. Here is Peter Shaver, and here is the diagram he plotted, produced back in the early 1990s. Uh, I got to explain this. Uh, we have a sphere of radius about 100 megaparsecs. That's about, well, let's see. The Hubble length at which you get relativistic is 4,000 megaparsecs. This is a small fraction of that, but it's big. Uh, in this di diagram, you, you define a plane. The plane defined by the flat distribution of nearby galaxies at distances of about tenths of this. So you have a flat plane nearby, just extrapolate it. That is the plane of the local supercluster extrapolated all its way out. Now look at the positions of radio galaxies. Here's one. Here's its position. This length of the line tells you how far it is above the plane of the local supercluster. You see that this is toward the edge of the plane seen slightly tilted from edge on. You look at that and you say, OK, it's above the plane and it's toward the back end. Here is a radio galaxy that is below the plane, but not very far. And it's near, near the edge and toward, a little toward the front of the plane. So you got that? This is a nice way of producing a three-dimensional plot in two dimensions. Kind of neat. Uh, now. He has data on the positions of galaxies. He has the data on the positions of very luminous radio sources. And you see something truly remarkable. The radio galaxies like to be near the plane, extended plane of the local supercluster. Galaxies, by and large, don't. That is a really remarkable result that I do not know uh, why is, I can't complete the sentence. Why aren't people advertising the fact of this curious behavior of, galaxy, of, of radio galaxies and ordinary galaxies? These are the most luminous radio galaxies. These are less luminous but still powerful radio galaxies. These are just luminous galaxies, optically luminous galaxies. Isn't this neat? Um, here is a, a, a made, I have made in the past several times plots illustrating Shaver's phenomenon with more modern, more recent data. So on the left, clusters of galaxies detected by X-ray emission from the plasma. So a cluster of galaxies, you know, has hot plasma between the galaxies. That plasma radiates in X-rays. Uh, X-rays are relatively easy to detect in a satellite. 
So we have a pretty good and complete sample of massive clusters of galaxies detected out to fairly large distances. Uh, and here they are. Here is a sample. Uh, there are 44 of them out to this distance of 80 megaparsecs. There are here, I choose the 45 galaxies that are most luminous at wavelengths around 60 microns. There was an all-sky survey of a satellite that picked up radio, uh, infrared sources, sources at wavelengths around 60 microns. Among them are many little point-like sources, hence the word PS, point source, although it wasn't really a point source because the resolution uh, of the satellite was not great. But many of them turned out to be galaxies that happen to be very luminous in the far infrared. It is thought because in these galaxies, very rapid star formation had made lots of massive stars. Massive stars tend to produce smoke, which is to say dust. The dust is so abundant that it absorbs the starlight and re-radiates the energy of these young stars in the infrared. So it's kind of a nice comparison, I think. On the one hand, you have uh, clusters of galaxies that contain old stars, very little star formation. On the right, you have galaxies that are producing, prodigiously producing young stars uh, and dust. And uh, can you see a difference? There are indeed radio uh, cl clusters of galaxies that are well off the plane, but they're not many. Most seem to be in the plane where the, uh, these galaxies that are produces, producing uh, stars at a high rate don't seem to much prefer the plane. You notice there is a little preference for the plane. Quite a few of these guys are close to it, as I'll discuss in a moment, but by and large, there is, I think, a distinct difference. Do you agree? And isn't that interesting? What's going on? Not that I know. Um, so, um, oh, <laughs> and you know, I complain. Why aren't people talking about this phenomenon? Uh, well, one measure uh, of interest in this phenomenon, that here are here are the, the, the ADS, Astrophysical Data System. Here, here is a list of papers that have cited Peter Shaver's 1991 paper. And you notice one here, 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 <laughs> here, and here. Uh, I'm the major contributor of citations of Peter's paper. <laughs> Why are people so indifferent to this? And if I'm so fascinated by why haven't I done anything about <laughs> this? Well, OK, so at last I have done something. And here is the game I propose to play before your very eyes. So you're all familiar with counting objects in cells. People do it in all sorts of fields. In this case, the cell will be a disk where it's very thin. Uh, ratio diameter to thickness 30 to 1. Uh, really thin. I'm going to take these disks and count the, star count the galaxies in them, or the clusters of galaxies. I'll count objects in these disks. I'll put the disks in various distances from us, various orientations. And you know a computer uh, loves this repetitive work. Place the disk at random, count the galaxies, or count the objects. And then uh, and eventually uh, discover whether there are special distances and orientations in which the disk contains an unusually large count of objects. That's the game. A little detail. I choose an axis from the origin. Uh, I place these disk cells with the normal uh, along this axis, and I stack them. I put one in the origin and 10 to the left, 10 to the right. I couldn't do that using the limited plotting uh, ability of Keynote. So I, I, I tried hard to make a, a series of these and I messed it up. So uh, you'll have to imagine that. And now the game is simply choose a random direction for that or axis, count the objects in each of the 21 cells, 
and record the result when the account in one of the cells is unusually large. You do it, uh, and it could do it, I'm impressed to say, a million times in six minutes for a thousand objects, for, for 6,000 objects. Wow. I grew up in the age of IBM punch cards, <laughs> uh, so I'm deeply impressed. Uh, so, what are some results? Well, the first thing to look at is uh, the De Vaucouleur local supercluster. So I take uh, disk cells that are 15 megaparsecs across. Uh, that's, that's seven and a half me megaparsecs distance. And that includes the local group of galaxies and a few of the outliers. Uh, make it a half a megaparsec thick to get that 30 to one. And then try to find a direction where the counts are unusually large. I divide the data into three samples of luminosity. <coughs> each scan the sky for each and find the direction uh, of where the count is largest. Uh, I find that one direction will pretty close to completely get the maximum count in each of these ranges of luminosity. And here it is. Here are the counts along the cylinder of, of cells, 21 of them. Uh, along here. That's the distance from the origin in these cells. And here are the counts in cells at that particular direction. And you see uh, that galaxies of all sorts are really tightly concentrated toward this plane. A plane that is some five degrees off the plane de Vaucouleur defined back in the 1950s a spectacular accomplishment with the data he had to get the plane so close to right. But there it is. Um, galaxies large and small like to be in this plane. That's nearby, relatively speaking, but it is a remarkably tight plane. A challenge for those of you who love to do numerical simulations, make a simulation of the galaxy distribution predicted in the standard theory and apply this test. Would you get such thin distributions often? Well, I'd love to know. Um, we can do now explore larger things. So in this plot, what I'm asking is, if you point these cells in random directions and you point, look at counts, is there a direction in which you get a particularly large count? Now, you have to notice that curve uh, here is a death, here is one of these cells, and here it's its direction. But of course, this direction is the same as this direction. So the full sky contains counts in doubly, right? You have, to, you have to eliminate half the sky because this is the same as this. So th below that curved line, you don't plot because it has the same data as outside that curved line. And what you find is, in this sample, uh, at redshifts ranged here, distance less than, well, for technical reasons, these are not round numbers, but about 90 megaparsecs, roughly 100. Uh, luminous enough, these are, these are galaxies detected at two micron survey uh, and have their and, uh, have redshifts measured. It's a particularly useful sample of galaxies with measured redshifts and other properties. <coughs> I'm using only luminosity. You gotta be bright enough to be seen to the maximum distance of this sample. And uh, just, just ask, where, where are they counts largest? And you find that at the dots, the counts are bigger than 500. And at the blacks, the counts are bigger than 600. You notice something wonderfully neat. There are two spots where the counts are large. And what's more, A is most dear to my heart because it is tilted only 15 degrees from that plane of the local supercluster at 15 megaparsecs across. So this, this, uh, this local galaxy survey out to uh, seven and a half megaparsecs defines a direction that is almost the same as the direction you get in this sample 
out to uh, nearly 100 megaparsecs. Isn't that neat? Uh, furthermore, there are two clumps. You know, uh, a question that has obsessed me for a long time, if the local supercluster is so flat, then there ought to be other flat distributions. I've not heard any advertised. There are lots of, uh, for example, large quasar groups uh, and uh, local walls, walls of galaxies, but they're all curved. This is flat. Remember, 30 to 1, a really flat distribution. Uh, and uh, surely there is more than, and we, we know about that flatness because we're sitting in the middle of the de Vaucouleur local supercluster. We can see it's flat. Uh, I've given you just recently a, 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 a more detailed measurement of the flatness, but we know that we've known it for a long time. And what you see demonstrated is that this guy, uh, is a different sheet. It has a different direction. And furthermore, uh, the sheet has a distance. If we're here and this is the sheet, then you see that this is the distance. The sheet A is running through us. We, we are contained in the local supercluster and we're contained in sheet A. It's the same sheet, essentially, but slightly bent. Sheet B is closest to us at 17 megapar at 15 megaparsecs. It's a different sheet. One that we've never known about, but there it is, a sheet. I keep saying, isn't that neat? Because I believe it. <laughs> um, so what can we do next? Ah, once you've found a direction, remember you have this row of 21 cells the orientation is such that one of the cells contains a lot of galaxies or a lot of objects. You can then look at a plot of the counts in, in the successive layers of cells. So here is, is the maximum of sheet A. And as I said, it's at zero distance from us. We're in sheet A. Here are the counts at different, in different cells running away from that central cell. For sheet B, it's a different direction, but uh, you go, you look at the counts of cells along that direction, and you see again a pronounced peak. That is where the sheet is localized maximally, and here, uh, much less, much, much fewer counts. This dotted line, by the way, is the count you get if you just average over directions at a given distance from the origin. So we have a pronounced phenomenon here, a pronounced peak in counts in one thin shell with a particular direction at a particular distance from us, and far fewer counts in cells that are just one thickness of the cell away to the left and the right, to up and down. So here is a summary of what's, well, no, we, <coughs> you, you, you remember now upper right, uh, upper left. Clusters like to be near the plane of the local supercluster. Star forming galaxies don't. Uh, but yet when you look at two MRS galaxies, galaxies detected at two microns, you find that there are a lot of them, some 8,000. Uh, they define two, two directions, one of which is the plane of the local supercluster. And here you have the counts, the peaks at the two places. Uh, a conclusion, there is in, in, in the cosmic structure uh, planes that are remarkably flat, 30 to 1 ratio, uh, in which the counts are un unusually large. A pattern that is curiously interesting. I'm gonna come back to this because it gets too messy. Uh, important, of course, you could, you could complain that uh, always you will find a direction and a distance in which the count of objects is maximum. You will always get a maximum, of course. 
The question is, is it an interesting maximum? One very important check is to ask, do these planes, the, do detections of these planes extend to different, to disjoint samples at greater distances? So I go to a greater distance. Here it is. This is a disjoint sample. Disjoint. It doesn't know about what was going on in the previous measurement. Uh, here, there, there are lots of, this is a much bigger volume, and in order to have interesting numbers of counts, I have to increase the cell size. Where is it? Somewhere. I guess I didn't remember to put it on. This is a sample, 8,000 of the two Mars galaxies. This is the distance range. These are bright enough to be detectable at, that dis at the outer distance. 10 oh yeah, here is 10 megaparsecs thick now, not five, and uh, 30 megaparsecs across at 150. So they're bigger, but they're still very thin relative to their thickness, relative to their widths. And uh, where does this count exceed 220? You see that if the distance from the origin is zero, you plot in black. If you see the diff, the distance from the origin is 15 megaparsecs, you plot in red. And you see here is cell B, and here is cell, here sheet B. Here is sheet A. It's reproduced. That is to say, in an independent sample, you see evidence of the same sheet, which is to say, this sheet is continuing, and it's the, it is, the, the continuation is detected. We can go on. But I think, yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, I guess I, did I go, let's see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the next range of distances. So now the distance range is 0.042 to 0.085. I double again the range of distance in order to have reasonable counts in cells. I double the count, the cell size. It's now 20 megaparsecs thick and 600 megaparsecs diameter. And then you look around and you see for galaxies this concentration of points. It's detected again. And clusters, there's enough of them that you can try the same game, and they're detected too. So we have detection in three independent samples of the same sheet A. That means, I think, very compelling evidence that this is a real pattern in cosmic structure. And now you ask yourself the musical question, is this what you would expect in lambda CDM, the standard theory? I certainly don't expect that. And so I'm going to wrap up, leaving time, I hope, for discussion and debate on what is sort of a remarkable thing, that here is a pattern in data that has been around for decades that no one has noticed. And it's something that is surprising within our present understanding of the origin of cosmic structure. So I'm going to leave wordy supplementary contact com com comments uh, up there. And I'm going to ask you to express your opinions. <laughs> what do you think? So thank you.